This is day two of the February 95 seven day retreat in spring water. All kinds of things have come up in meetings. One person said something like this, I never remember verbatim. It sounds good hearing of a place of no wanting. Of course, instantly we want to be in that place of no wanting. But the reason I'm bringing it up right now is not to, to go into wanting, but how do we hear what is being said? And it's an interesting phenomenon that we don't hear most of the time precisely what is said, but our listening is already preformed. Throughout our whole life, it has been preformed, prejudiced, conditioned. So, if someone say, talks about not wanting, we hear it as a desirable thing that should take place in me. And the opposite should not. So very often in, in looking at things together here in a talk in which words come out, are spoken, uh, what is heard is, this is how I should be. And the opposite, which is what I am, I should not be. I should get rid of that. Or this is not how I should be talking about wanting. I shouldn't be wanting. It's, it seems to be implied in what is being said. The desirability or undesirability of it, the value of it, or the lack of value of it. It may not be implied at all, but we hear it that way. I never intentionally say, get rid of this, don't be that. What, is, what talks are all about is an open invitation to look at what is going on in ourselves as being, as being described in a talk and also looked at in a talk doesn't mean, now, this is not what you should be doing. Do the opposite. No, it, on the contrary, it says, let's look at this, which is happening in all of us. Things that are talked about are never unique situations. But what is commonly so in all of us, and therefore observable, discoverable, And the amazing thing is that when discovery or as discovery takes place, really seeing an instant of, of wanting something, seeing it. If any change is happening, it doesn't come out of not wanting to want, but out of seeing, wanting. Could put it this way if we wrote it, seeing and in parenthesis, wanting. It doesn't matter what is seen. Seeing is the change in our moment-to-moment -moment living. Is there a moment that is clear and open? Presence? Or is it just the running of programs? One of the most deeply conditioned ones being fearing and wanting. It's really two sides of the same coin. Because there's fear we want, fear of lack, fear of incompletion, of insufficiency, 
fear of not being any good, being a failure. Out of that comes wanting, making up for, lack. And out of wanting comes fear. We want something, but we're afraid we won't get it or we'll lose it. Or when we have it, we get used to it. And fear, boredom. So discovering that for oneself, not just remembering the words that somebody speaks, making a person into an authority. We talked about that yesterday. Because I have made, or thought has made her into an authority, therefore thought says what she says must be right. I don't need to test it. I'll just remember it. That does not lead to discovery. Discovery comes out of questioning. Questioning everything that we think we know, that we think is true. Wondering about it all in a new way. The new way being not immediately expecting answers, solutions, but staying, particularly in a retreat, it's very possible, staying with that state of wondering, of wonderment. which is this vast, infinite field of not knowing. In which moment to moment discovery can take place. Discovery of what really is. This moment. A bird singing, but not the words, not the idea of it. A motor humming, not the description of it. Certain feelings and tensions in the body, not the idea of it, the worry about it, the explanations for it, but the actuality of it. With, with no separation in between. Separation comes through worrying, anticipating, condemning, accepting. All of this creates separation between the one who observes and what he, she observes. Which is an illusory chasm, an illusory division created by thought and maintained by thought. Because thought and moment-to-moment -moment thinking identifies with an entity which we think, say, describe as me. It becomes tricky. The, the tension in the body observed, we also say, that's me, do we? It's my tension, my pain, my thoughts, my body, my identity. That's why was actually going to go into is this whole vast thing of identity, identifying. But before coming to this, let us enter into what several people who are here for the first time have asked. Is there any practice here? Can you give any suggestions to what to do? Some people say, I've done such and such in other places. Is it all right to do this here? Or do you suggest something different? All that is suggested is to look what's here. Now, it is so simple. Not easy, but simple. If, if the practice that one likes to carry on here is uh, repeating a mantra, following the breathing or 
counting the breathing? Is it happening mechanical while one thinks of something else at the same time? You can think of three, four things at the same time and hum a song to boot. <laughs> Or is there really the fullness, which is the emptiness of attention? And just the breathing and birds calling without making a story out of it. Story making is beautiful and very tricky. Again, absorbs the mind and then the breathing is nowhere is there in the awareness. There's now involvement in the story about me and those wonderful birds that I hear of a sunny morning. You, you write the story. <laughs> and feeling good about this. We love our stories. We, we sun ourselves in them and hate ourselves in them. Terrorize ourselves with them and gratify ourselves with them feel sorry for ourselves in them, try to get pity from others for the stories we present about ourselves, our victimization. It's endless and a marvelous, simple thing to watch. Not easy because involvement in story with its emotions and upheavals, turmoil, or pleasures is not the same as insight or awareness this moment that a story is running with all the physical accompaniment. Let me say it again. Involvement in the story, how wonderful I am or how, how desolate, how poor, pitiable, enviable. Invol involvement in that story with its physical tensions and pleasures and energies is not the same as seeing a story is running and how the body responds in an amazing fashion to a story running in the mind. All of a sudden feeling depressed and sad or elated at the thought of something wonderful that's very likely going to happen to me next week. Body is energized at that thought just as it is de-energized at the thought of something horrible happening, or just the thought, well, nothing's going to happen to me ever. So this is something to discover moment to moment. And the beauty of that discovery of story running and the body so affected and impacted by the story, the beauty of this discovery is that Instantly, at that moment, the story doesn't have to keep running. That's quite clear. Actually, it often comes up as a question. Does this have to continue? And then to notice how either one wants to drag on with it, one doesn't want to let go of this sob story, or whatever it is, pleasure story, success story, or failure story. Doesn't want to get let go of it. There's sort of an addictive mode to our stories. Very physical. The mental and the physical are so intertwined. It's another marvelous discovery. Because we may have thought until now that thoughts are something very special and separate from the coarseness of the body. It's not. A thought is also a feeling. A feeling translates itself very quickly into a thought. And that thought creates further feelings and emotions and tensions, which create further thought. And it's not separable. So, let's come back to this. It's very important to since we're talking about it, occupying ourselves with this in, in a very quiet, quite energetic atmosphere, it may be possible more and more to come upon the fact that this, the body is just responding to a mental story. 
storyline, I sometimes call it, just phrases about myself and discovering that. And at the moment of discovery, does the thought come up, oh my God, I shouldn't be making stories she talked about and she implied I shouldn't. No, that's not implied at all. What is said is discover it and discover what thoughts come up. I shouldn't? Or does the thought come up, why? Why continue with this? Is it necessary? Or if, if the seeing, the insight is very strong, which it is at times, then the story is blasted. It's not necessary. That's impl this is inbuilt into the insight, the intelligence of, of seeing instantly what need not continue. But if it isn't instant, a thought wondering, why do I do this? And don't have to go on with it. I don't have to tell everybody. Including myself. How poor I am or how wonderful I am. And it's such an instant result, if you will. No story and the body can relax and, and come to a more normal state of functioning, which is impeded by all of this accompanying the stories. It always has to swing high, intense or low, depressed. I'm not saying, please, I'm not implying that all depression, all elation is necessarily due to stories that are running. But a lot of them are. And the state of being changes with that discovery for that moment. And we were touching upon it a little while ago. If one's really interested and the attention is there to look, maybe the realization, I don't want to end with it. I want to go on with my dream, just like waking up in the morning from a dream. We all know this. If it was a wonderful dream, we want to dream it to the end. Ah, oh, too bad it was interrupted. How did it end up? Of course, if, if it was a nightmare, we're glad to wake up to the fact that it, none of this is true and be in awe of how real a dream can appear when there's no waking up to it. And the same with story lines, descriptions about ourselves. It's so real. It's me. Until there's a, an insight that it is story, without much substance usually, just reflecting our state of discontent or wanting or fearing. which are also insubstantial conditionings, going way back in time, only made substantial by all the heavings and, and, and uh, turmoiling of the body, the tensions, that makes it seem real. But those bodily tensions too, one can experiment with this beautifully in a retreat, have all this time for checking things out, really going into a physical tension, pain, whatever we call it. First discovery is the word pain is not what's aching here, but the word pain can trigger more discomfort by, through fear or panic. This is get, going to get worse or so. So that's part of what we find. So can one wisely leave out the labels and words and names for one's inner conditions? Because with this wise leaving out of the label and description, what's there reveals itself in a new way that was not available or accessible 
as long as the word sat on top. And with the word gone, put aside for the moment because there's a, a genuine interest in what is this tension that I've had almost all my life, in the chest, in my shoulders, in the back. What is it really? And letting, being, being comfortable, not putting oneself into a painful posture with that. Being at ease. Maybe the posture is easy. What, what unfolds? What reveals itself? One person this morning wondered whether there is really as much of a delineation of this body, separation from what's not this body as one had thought. We find the body is just moving, blocking, or freeing energy, which is not different from the energy of all around one, of sounding and warming and cooling and harding and touching and softing, eating, swallowing. So, thoughts are not solid and neither is the body solid. It just appears this way because we think of it this way. What I am, I am my body. This here. So touchable, palpable, real. And yet, medical science tells us it's constantly changing, renewing itself. Because the change one notices oneself as one gets older. Whether one feels getting old or not, the cells today are not the cells of a month ago or a year or seven years ago. I think seven years is the longest time it takes for any one part of this body to renew itself. Constantly flowing, changing, composing and decomposing. Some of the uh, hints of that are experienceable in quiet sitting without labels, just the movement of energy and non-separation from what one has thought is not body, outside the body. So with, with this, maybe we come to the question that will resonate throughout the retreat talks and meetings probably in one way or another. What is my true identity? Oh, I never even, I never even went into what to do, what is suggested, or did I? Yes, just find out what is. As Mantram is recited or breath is followed. And one may find holding too rigidly to a practice somehow prevents the openness of attending to whatever is going on. But this is, should not be imposed from the outside. It should be discovered from the inside. That's why I never ask people to abandon what they were doing. Well, who am I to do that? It's not my function to assign or disassign things, but to, to join in, in exploring what is going on. So in this connection, someone asking me whether koans were meaningful to me as I studied them, I don't remember quite the the whole dialogue there. But I do remember saying that the most meaningful question to me was, 
what am I? Not as a repetitive thing placed someplace in the body on the inhalation or exhalation. Not that way, but the wondering of what I really was or am. What's my true identity? If we begin to ponder what our identity is, I think it, it'll be an infinite list, almost infinite list that we can think of. All the things that we can think of, what we are and what we're not. the body, the mind, the spirit, the soul, man, woman, senior citizen, middle-aged, young, but getting older. All of our family history, ethnic identity, religious identity, just swept through my mind here when I grew up in, in Germany. After Hitler came to power, we all had to have our identity established and that meant pretty much just are you Jewish or not? Jewish or Aryan? Or part Jewish? And then you had to find out how many parts and you were Jewish. a half, a quarter, an eighth. All of that was very important, very important. There were documents issued to that effect. I remember we had a, a woman who lived with us all the time we were in Germany. She, she was the cook in our family. She came from Poland. And she was asked to write back home to Poland to establish her racial identity. And she did write, she came from a little village from a farming area, and the letter that came back said, your ancestors were all good people, let them rest in peace. We were very impressed with that. I don't know how she got away with it, but she did. With the officials, I mean. So, what, what else is our identity? You name it. What I know, a very important identity. What all I know. What I can do, my, my skills, my talents, my gifts. I identified with that. And by that meaning, this is me. The strong feeling, this is me. Part of me. And to be enjoyed by thinking about it and by letting other people know about it in one way or another, through the story, through hints, and the opposite of it, my identity, what I don't know, my failures, my lack of education, strong identity, my lack of education, my failures my painful childhood, strong identity, or my happy childhood, powerful identity. Just any which way we think about ourselves is our identity for that moment, isn't it? Meaning, the body gleans some energies from that thought or phrase or story and is ready to defend it if someone would attack it. Before defending it is the hurt, the hurt at being offended in one's identity. There's this, this identity of what I am, may not even be clearly expressed, but someone saying, no, you're not this, you're that. I 
is hurt. We all know that. It happens all the time. All day long, mostly, for a lot of people. Or at least once a day. Every other day, one has to watch it. Feeling hurt because the identity that is assumed and thought about and invested in, by investing in, I mean gleaning feelings and energies from it, that gets punctured by somebody not living up to it, not respecting it, not accepting it, or humiliating it, laughing about it, ridiculing it. It's such an important process in our daily life that I don't think a retreat goes by without talking about it and going into it. Because if we could only unveil this as it happens, we usually don't. We fight over it. Attack and defend, get angry, hurt, or withdraw, sulk, and nurture by ourselves our wounded identity. Maybe with some friends who are sympathetic, who identify with us. <laughs> Meaning, they have some feeling for what we're going through because we're all going through the same thing. We don't like to be hurt in our identities, which are like invisible layers of bubbles around us. All of them very vulnerable. Because anybody can say, no, you're not this, you're that. I don't accept this, I don't respect it. Or saying somebody else is much better than you are. Certainly, I am better than you are. Not saying it directly, but implying it. And it hurts and angers and smarts and arouses sadness and a desire to, for revenge. You hurt my identity, I'll hurt yours back. It doesn't proceed so rationally, but it proceeds very automatically, almost with the sureness of a psychological law. I remember once discussing with my father, who was a scientist, very accurate thinker, writer, researcher, lecturer. And when I was starting to study psychology, he wondered what laws are there in psychology? that are accurate. He was interested. He wasn't attacking me. We had a good relationship. And I couldn't think of much at the time. But this here, if he was still alive, I would tell him, this is, you could almost pronounce it a law. Something done to me, I got to do it back to someone else. Same person, some other person, or myself. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, demonstrated all over history, up to this present moment. Avenge the victim. And a lot of victimization is the hurt of the image. That's how we feel victimized. Be being made fun of or slurred. So now, what, what is our identity? All this bubble stuff? Language seems to imply that it's not, doesn't it? I'm questioning it. Seriously. It seems so real, it seems so, so true, and the hurt seems to prove, yeah, this is me. I was hurt, we say that, I really got hurt when you said that to me. Boy, I still remember it, and if I remember it in a year, I may still work myself up in the memory. All the while, not questioning, what am I holding on to? 
What is the process that is involved of identifying with, we've listed already a whole panorama of things and that's not the end of it. We, we, I think that one sentence that came out, anything we think about ourselves is an identity. Unless it's clear that it's just something we're thinking about or that it is just thought coming out of what? Discontent, insufficiency, needing to be affirmed, a need for being someone, to watch it all. And this is possible in a retreat like this. If no hurt comes up right now, and it may, people tell me they got hurt over a note they received, not in this retreat yet. <laughs> Somebody wrote them a note about their cooking or their cleaning, and it got so hurt. Usually, though, it goes hand in hand with, with looking, too, and wondering. Yeah, people tell me that, too. How amazingly this dissolves when it's looked at rather than harboring this resentment and, and, and firing it up by, by memory and, and going through the thing over and over without an intelligent insight into it. So am I this body? First of all, this name, all my vital statistics, when I was born, where I come from, my family, my abilities, talents, non-talents, lacks. Is all of that what I am? And if something changes, I don't think of myself as this way or that way anymore. Has my identity changed, diminished? Or think some more, has my identity increased? Does this question grab one, what am I? I think on the first evening of this retreat, the question came up, what am I when I don't know? What are birds and sounds and sights and light and cold and food and rest when I don't know when there is a new way of being coming out of not knowing? Without identity, not knowing the identity. Maybe there is none at all. Maybe it's all artificial bubbles upon bubbles. Like when you blow them from a straw or swing them from a ring. Sometimes bubbles upon bubbles upon bubbles. A beautiful, colorful conglomerate. And then it bursts and just leaves empty space. Full of everything, but empty of identity. Because clearly everything is changing all the time, every instant. So what am I, am I in all of that? Something separate that needs to know that? Or can I start, can we start from not needing to know? And yet with this not needing to know and unfolding sensitivity to what is there, here, now. Before we know it, made it into a word, into a memory, into associations with the known. Is that a good question for retreat day two? I don't know. Certainly when the next hurt occurs, 
will the question come up, what am I? This picture of myself, this deep conviction about what I am, how I should be treated, feels that way, doesn't it, at that moment? And the defenses are there to keep it going, to protect it. Can it be watched for a moment without investment, pro or con? Because we've only mentioned hurt, the other side of that same coin is flattery. Because it doesn't hurt, because it feels so good, we're prone not to investigate it much. Leave those things alone that feel good. But it merits looking into it just as hurt does. What is it that gets flattered? And what is the response arising from it? Wanting more of it? That is it, isn't it? One of the responses, more please. Got to see that person again, who talked so nicely about me to me. And all the while, nurturing what? Energies arising out of images about myself. Which, whether they're positive images or negative images, are just bubbles, ready to burst at any time. Will thought immediately build them up again? Because there's the thought that we need them, we can't exist without them. Let's watch it. We will end here for today.